So I've been requested to respond on Vicky1999 again, and this time it's on the Council Communism. Hello everybody, what is Council Communism? Well, essentially it is a form of socialism in which the workers are in charge of the state and economy via a system of workers' councils. So the problem with this argument that Vicky's got is it's very ideological and communism has to get rid of the private sector completely. The private sector isn't just given up through negotiating. It's not a case that private landowners and business owners just negotiate with the state, you know, decide to just give it up. What if private land and business owners decide not to? Even if society collectively votes to dictate what someone else can and cannot own? Again, that's like mob rule. You have your individual rights and liberty, and the only way that you can take that away from someone has to be done through the use of coercion, and that's done through the use of the state. Well, hypothetically speaking, if the state just takes ownership of all of it, let's say the com private sector's completely gone, how's the state just going to wither away. You never get an answer as to how the state's just going to wither away. You have to use a dictator in order to get you there. There's a strong difference between that of communism and socialism in general, theoretically, to that of the real world. The real world is money only comes from two places and I was asked that question, you know, why? Well, at the end of the day, the public sector doesn't generate enough to pay tax money. It doesn't pay tax. Tax money is paid by that of the private sector. It's the private sector taxpayer that funds the public public sector and if you're not getting from the private sector taxpayer, well you're left running the printing press. The problem with that is the fact that when you're trying to get rid of the private sector, well how else are you going to pay people wages? And running the printing press of course is faced with the inflationary problem. On the road of trying to get rid of the private sector, they're going to be faced with a serious inflationary problem. Society is going to break out in riots as I've touched upon before, in protests etc because of the high inflationary problems. Well what's the state going to do? Again, time and time again, the state enacting these price controls, so in other words, price ceilings, and it results in the price shortage problems. On their path towards their ideological position, they're faced with many consequences for their actions. In other words, economic reality doesn't permit their ideological position. And I've even had concession from herself before. People do want to be paid a wage, that she does support paying people a wage, and running the printing press, you're just going to be eventually facing hyperinflation. Council communism is broadly a left communist movement, which means it falls towards the left on the spectrum of communist ideologies. For example, to the left of Leninism. And that's the first feature of council communists. They don't like Leninism. As you are probably aware, in 1917, Lenin and his party started the October Revolution in the Russian Empire. Their party was the so-called vanguard of the revolution, meaning they did all the revolution in the name of the working class. The reason why Vladimir Lenin could not reach the realization of the theoretical ideology of communism, why it could never be achieved, is because it's impossible, not just from a human nature perspective, economics just doesn't permit it. So that's the very reason why Vladimir Lenin could not get rid of the market completely. He wanted to, and there's a difference between what you want. You can have good intentions and intend for something to be a certain given way, but again, it doesn't mean to say it turns out that way in practice, and it doesn't. You have to control society. I mean, could you imagine that over 65 million people in Great Britain alone? How the hell do you keep everybody on the same page? How the hell do you stop people from going and doing their own thing? All the self-interest, etc. And she's just imagining this idea that, of course, the workers will own and control the state from an ideological position. How is that going to be in the real world? This party later developed into the enforcer of the dictatorship of the proletariat and the only way to be politically active in the USSR. It also developed into a centralized bureaucracy. Again, she doesn't understand the reality of why it ended up with a centralised bureaucracy. You've got to remember, as they're dealing with a very large population, how the hell do you keep everybody in the same page? Well, that's why the Soviet Union brought in the five-year plan. They couldn't have individual communes competing with one another, individual communes going and doing different things. In other words, in the name of equality, and this is what their agenda has always been about, they have to keep everybody in the same page because it's a contradiction then. What are you going to do about the type of people like myself who would refuse to? Who doesn't want anything at all today with collectivism? Well, what do you do about people like that then? Because after all, you have to keep 
private ownership at the site, well you've got no other choice but to try and control them. Council communists oppose this development. They think the workers should run the revolution directly, not via a vanguard party. They also believe that the party centralized power with non-workers and turned the party members into a separate political class. In council communism there is no political class which rules. Instead all control is fragmented and given to decentrally organized councils. What are you going to do about the individuals who disagree with all of that? So how the hell are you going to stop private ownership returning? That's the thing that they never answer and they'll never give you an answer to that question. Well, what we saw within the Capitol Hill Autonomous Zone, anybody who tried to go and do their own thing, you ended up seeing mob rule from specific individuals trying to dictate to other people what they can and cannot do and they look to outlaw that. They say oh well that's theft, you can't do that to someone. So in other words they have to try and control and dictate to you what you can and cannot do with your life and the only way that you can do that is through violence. All workers in one area form a council, like the council of Vienna's artisans. It's basically all of them get to decide for your individual life. Collectivism subordinates the individual rights and liberty and she's going on about how well at the end of the day they'll vote for this workers council. Now ideologically it sounds like well the workers are so powerful but yeah they're voting for basically a workers council who's basically going to act as governance. And then they elect one or multiple of themselves to represent them on the city council. The problem with this is the fact that it's got certain individuals who are more influential than others. She might like to have you believe how the system works as people collectively vote for the right type of people to do these certain things. Well, how the hell do you think you ended up with a self-serving government today? And at the end of the day, the central planners end up becoming more powerful than the rest. You're faced with the knowledge problem, the economic calculation problem. Prices are going to go flying right out the window because there's no market-driven prices in their ideological position. So how the hell do they know how much to produce what to produce etc. Well the bottom line is is they're going to base production down to the collective and what you're left with is basically the idea that somehow we all like the same food, we all like the same clothes and even if they try to argue to you and say well through personal ownership of possessions I'm not going to go into that argument how the hell is it supposed to work out production for each and every single individual of society without the information of prices so they won't know the needs and wants of you know the workers etc. <laughs> That's essentially what it is. It's centralization of power towards a national council. Which then elects representatives for the local council, which then elects members for the national council. Because all these representatives are workers, this way there is a dictatorship of the proletariat and no political class can form. All representatives are still artisans in their day-to-day -day life and they only do the tasks of politicians when the council is meeting. Well, that is what a politician is. She might not like to call them a politician, but they are politicians. They don't understand that these people end up in a position of power and they end up being more influential than those of the workers councils, the one below that. This person's going to have a great influence over the lives of so many millions of people. What about the individual again? The individual's out of the question. All the higher councils could at any point be dissolved by the lower councils, ensuring that the higher councils still act in a way that the people agree with. These representatives would also be able to be recalled at any point, making sure they follow the will of the workers, unlike the representatives we have now, which need to get elected one time and then do whatever they want to for four years, ignoring their constituents. The economy would also be controlled by councils, meaning workers would collectively own their own workplaces. These workplaces would interact via a market or be managed by councils in a form of a decentrally planned economy. Again, you're going down the road is the same thing with holding the market which is basically just exactly what the Soviet Union did and then you see the central planning. She might not like to call it central planning because decentralization essentially means that individuals are able to do their own thing and run their own private businesses etc. You can't decentralize the economy and have communal ownership at the same time. That's just it's an oxymoron and even then they could use the argument kind of like what you see with the kibbutz in Israel. She doesn't explain what the role of that that national council is. They're going to have to try and govern society because you can't have individual self-interest. In other words, individuals going and doing their own thing. You have to actually go down the road of trying to control society. I mean, if you've got a population of 65 million people, 
what you're going to do. Council communists consider social democrats and traditional non-revolutionary trade unions to be allies to the bourgeoisie who are used to distract the workers from the necessary revolution. They want to boycott electoral politics and non-revolutionary unions. The revolution is to be started by the workers themselves, no vanguard party. Because it is so decentralized, it is often compared to different forms of anarchism, especially syndicalism. The idea is that during a crisis of capitalism, councils will naturally form, kind of like how Soviets formed before the October Revolution. These councils then take over after the collapse of capitalism. So again, it's really all a case that it's going to go down the road of violence, and you've seen a real world example of that with the example of the Pinkertons, etc., who were bodyguards. They ended up violent from the strikers. The strikers took ownership over the town. They ended up taking ownership over the factory, and it was done through the use of violence. She doesn't mention that, however. You've seen that within the Paris Commune, the socialists basically using intimidation and violence. If you even dare to even think of starting up your own private business, they'll use violence against you. You're basically up against a people who want to force you into their way of, you know, thinking, their, their way of life. The influence, although they don't intend it for to be that way, they end up more powerful and more influential than the rest, and you end up under a dictatorship. You know, to try and cover it up, they'll say, oh, it's not a dictatorship. They try to say that, you know, Hugo Chavez was near dictator. <laughs> this is what you're dealing with. You may think that this system of councils selecting higher councils and sending representatives to a national government is kind of similar to the way the USSR worked. After all, it was made up of councils called Soviet, which represented the workers and elected delegates to the national government. The difference is that in the USSR, the Communist Party took part in the political process, while in true council communism, there is no party. So she's under the illusion that somehow, just because of some political party, that this makes it different. The reality is of why it took that position is because of the fact that they had to control an entire population to plan for. How the hell do you keep such a large population on the one page. Those in the National Council, like I say, are going to be more influential than the rest of them. <laughs> she just doesn't get that. Council communists also declared that the USSR was not an alternative to capitalism, that it itself was practically capitalist, with the full-time party officials and bureaucrats or apparatchiks taking over the tasks of the capitalists. Folk, it really is childish. Capitalism is about the separation of the economy from government. Basically speaking about that to do with a free market, and you're essentially talking about a market left be to regulate itself regarding prices, leaving it down to free trade, in the absence of all the government subsidies etc. The Soviet Union was this heavily centrally planned economy. It was as socialist as socialist could get. The only difference was is the fact that it couldn't reach the ideological position, the theoretical position, the end goal of communism because it's impossible. So yes, they did use an element of capitalism with regards to the whole thing to do with the market, but it was a market that was heavily centrally planned. All produce that was going into the shops and whatnot was centrally planned by the state. Prices were all centrally planned. The wages of the workers were all centrally planned. It was all top-down controlled. There was nothing at all today with capitalism. She's basically trying to say that capitalism is fascism and it's not. Fascism is actually inherently socialist and I don't need to go into that. Without workers oversight. So despite the USSR theoretically kind of being a bit like council communism, they hate each other like true leftists. They don't get it. They think that just because fascists opposed communists that that somehow made them less socialist. It's like the argument they say, Ado Adolf Hitler sent them to concentration camps to die and, 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 and he, got rid of, he, he got rid of the trade unions. Yeah, he got rid of the Weimar Republic's trade unions and he replaced them with his very own known as the German Labour Front in 1933. These things they don't even touch upon. They don't understand that Hitler was one of the biggest socialist in recorded history and, and, and such and such hates such and such. Well how then do you explain how Stalin came to power? Anyway folk I don't know if you've got anything you would like to add in. Comment in the comment section below. Be sure to like the video and share the video and of course I'll be sure to get back to you. Thank you for watching and I shall talk to you later. Cheers.